Hello everyone, this is Professor Suzuki. We are covering chapter seven in this lecture, thinking and intelligence, in other words, cognition. Now, before we begin, there is a video I'd like you guys to watch on YouTube. I have it right below. And once you finish, please hit resume on this lecture. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the rubber hand illusion. It is a fun example of what is studied in cognitive psychology. And that is the field of psychology dedicated to examining how people think. It studies the interaction among human thought, emotion, creativity, language, problem solving, and other cognitive processes. It also focuses on how we organize thoughts and information gathered from our environment into meaning categories of thought. Cognition itself refers to the encompass of the processes associated with perception, knowledge, problem solving, judgment, language, and memory. So the information, the sensations we receive, as well as the emotions and memories we have form our thoughts. That's a simple way to think about it. Now, when we talk about cognition, a few key terms we have to define. First, there are concepts. These are categories or groupings of linguistic information, objects, ideas, or life experiences. This can be broken into two categories. We have the natural concepts, the mental groupings created naturally through experiences. Fire, for example, is a great natural concept that we know. It is one that we understand through direct observation and experience. So we know fire will go out when you douse it with water because we've naturally experienced it in our life. The other form of concepts we see are artificial concepts, those defined by a very specific set of characteristics. Artificial concepts are one we know by a specific set of characteristics that are always exhibited, such as what define basic shapes. So the roundness of a circle or the four lines to the square that we always know as the basic characteristics. And within our concepts, we have prototypes, the best representation of a concept available. So a car could be a prototype for forms of transportation. Now before moving on, please watch the brief video right after. I believe it's called, uh, No, Please, I Have Three Kids. All right, so after seeing that video, it's a surprisingly great representation of the abstract metaphor of thought. Now, each of those boxes on those files we saw were schema, a mental construct consisting of a cluster or collection of related concepts. And those files inside, each of those files being shredded were concepts. Now within schemas, we have role schemas. These are expectations that define the behavior of a person in a particular role, firemen, police officers, teachers, the way we expect for them all to act, how they should behave in that role, those are the role schemas we have for them. Then there are, there are event schemas or cognitive scripts. These are set of behaviors that are performed the same time each way. These are the ways that we believe we're supposed to act in a given situation. So there are a couple of fun videos. One is titled The Elevator and another is Changing Schemas. Please watch those below for some fun we can have when we try to uh, change the schema or the regular scripts. Moving on from schema, let's talk a bit about language. Now, a few key terms. Language itself refers to the communication system that involves using words to transmit information from one individual to another. Every language contains a lexicon, that is the words of a given language, and we use grammar, the set of rules that are used to convey meaning through the use of a lexicon. Some more language terms. Language is broken down into phonemes and morphemes. The phonemes are the basic sound unit of a given language. So ah and e, eh, for example, are phonemes. Morphemes, on the other hand, are the smallest unit of language that convey some type of meaning. And interestingly enough, I is both a phoneme and a morpheme. A couple more language terms to remember. There are semantics, the process by which we derive meaning from morphemes and words as well as syntax, the manner by which words are organized into sentences. So when it comes to language development and thought, it is argued that we learn language either through reinforcement, that is continually exposure and practice, or that there is a biological predisposition for language acquisition. Either way, it is believed there's a critical period for language acquisition, and if we do not expose 
children early on to language, it will be very difficult to teach them. As it's shown that children only have really a semi mastery over language and it takes some time for them to develop true complex mastery over the language that they choose. So there's a short little video. It's a, you only need to watch about seven seconds. It's from the Rugrats, but it's a great example of children's semi mastery. And we can see in it uh, a case of overgeneralization to an extent. Overgeneralization refers to when children use a certain rule for a language to something that is an exception of the rule. So for some of you who have a kid brother or sister, have kids at home, you hear them say gooses when you know they're supposed to say geese. That's an example of overgeneralization. And interestingly enough, it's fair to note that our language can influence our thoughts and our perceptions. After all, some of us think in just one language, some of us think in two languages, and you know that sometimes your language has words that just, words or phrases really, that don't translate over. So before we move on, let's uh, try a little riddle real quick. You know, we're almost done with the week, so riddle me this. Now back in high school, believe it or not, I actually set a record as a pitcher for pitching the fewest number of pitches ever thrown in a high school game. What makes this record really crazy is that I played all nine innings from start to finish, never being subbed out, and I was able to throw a very low number of pitches. So my question to you all, this riddle, how many pitches did I throw? The correct answer is in three, two, one, 25. See the first eight innings, I kept throwing one pitch. It would be hit and caught, leading to an out, three, pitches per inning, three outs, pretty quick 24. Unfortunately, first pitch, bottom of the ninth, they hit a home run, so by pitch 25, the game was over. For those of you guys who thought 27, nice try, but sometimes it's just tough when you're uh, trying to figure out these riddles. So some of you probably engaged in some problem-solving strategies to try to figure that out. A problem-solving strategy is a method for solving problems. For example, we see these nine dots in this box to the right. Can you connect all nine dots with just four connected lines? In other words, if you were to print this out and draw lines through it, you cannot lift the pencil. Now, some of you may engage in some trial and error. That's a problem solving strategy in which you try multiple solutions until uh, you get the correct answer. Or maybe you'll use an algorithm approach, you'll look up the answer and find a specific set of instructions to see how to draw the four lines through these nine dots. Now, on the other hand, some of you may have already seen that riddle before and you'll engage in a heuristic, which is a mental shortcut that saves time when solving a problem. A common heuristic we see is working backwards. This is the heuristic in which you begin to solve a problem by focusing on the end result. By the way, if you're in a math class and you have the answers to uh, the text, using working backwards to get that answer and derive it back to the starting question is a great way to learn material. And heuristics are great because they save us time and help us quickly solve problems by using available information. We use heuristics when we have a little too much info on a certain question, when time is limited, when the decision we need to make is unimportant or there is very little applicable information available. And an appropriate heuristic can also be used when it just happens to come into mind. Fortunately, there are always some problems to everything, including problem solving. One is when we see people engaged in a mental set, continually using an old solution to a problem without results. After all, something that worked in the 90s may not work today. And we sometimes see mental set when people engaged in functional fixedness, that is the inability to see an object as useful for any other use than what it was intended for. So while SpongeBob is able to have a lot of fun with a box, Squidward is stuck in functional fixedness and just sees it as a useless box. Other problems to problem solving besides being unable to think outside of the box or being stuck in an old set of thinking are those pesky heuristics and biases. Now, biases, which are really just faulty heuristics, come in a variety of ways. One, time, one way we see it is when we have an anchoring bias, when someone fixates on a single aspect of a problem to find a solution. 
Other biases include confirmation bias. It is when you focus on information that confirms your belief rather than looking at evidence that disconfirms what is true. There are hindsight biases, the belief that an event experience was predictable despite the fact that it really wasn't. A lot of times when you hear people say, I knew it, they probably were engaging in hindsight bias. Two more biases that we'll look at in this chapter. One is representative bias. That is when we are stereotyping without a valid basis for your judgment. We'll get more into the definition of stereotyping later, but it is the set of beliefs we have about a particular group. So one unfortunate stereotype or effect that exists is known as the what is beautiful is good effect. And that is exhibited in this representative heuristic when we sometimes will just go with whatever looks good thinking it's fine because of that stereotype in our mind. Another heuristic that we have is the availability heuristic where we make decisions based on information readily available to you. And the key terms here is that it's information to you as the individual using it. So in this little uh, gif to the right, we see a girl asking, so if you're from Africa, why are you white? Because in her availability heuristic, well, I'm sure you guys are smart enough to figure it out, <laughs> on, what I'm not gonna say, but it's the only information she has about the continent. Moving on to intelligence. There are three theories of intelligence we will talk about. The first is crystallized fluid intelligence. It is the type of intelligence split into two categories or two parts. There's the crystallized portion, which refers to the acquisition of knowledge and the ability to retrieve it. And there is the fluid portion, the ability to see complex relationships as well as solve problems. Now, the theory displayed on my screen is the triarchic theory of intelligence, and it establishes that there are three facets to intelligence. You have your analytical intelligence, your academic problem-solving abilities, your computation skills. You have your creative intelligence, your imaginative abilities, your innovative problem-solving, how well you think outside the box, and you have your practical intelligence, your street smarts, your common sense, and critical thinking skills. Last form of intelligence we will look at is the multiple intelligence theory. And this theory assesses that each person possesses multiple, eh, around seven, eight types of intelligence, and they can vary. And this is something that is really interesting in this intelligence theory because it breaks down the various types, including emotional intelligence, the ability to understand emotions and motivations in yourself and others, cultural intelligence, the ability in which people can understand and relate to those in other cultures, musical intelligence, the ability to understand and appreciate rhythm, pitch, and tone to be musically inclined, and even bodily kinesthetic intelligence, the ability to do high-level physical activities. So there are a couple of videos I'd like you guys to watch. One is for music intelligence. It really uh, exemplifies being intelligent in the form of being musically inclined. And the second video is just from the 133 to 213 mark, just so you can watch these two uh, athletes dunk. And if you catch it, you'll know that the second dunk is a replica of the first. It was an observation. The dunker, Zach Levine, sees what Aaron Gordon does and says, I can do that too, which for any athlete we know is pretty damn tough to do. So go ahead and check out those videos. Creativity. So now that we talked about intelligence, let's talk about some ways to measure intelligence, including creativity. Creativity is the ability to generate, create, or discover new ideas, solutions, and possibilities. Creativity is humor, design, innovation. It's very, very broad. And creativity includes divergent thinking. It's the ability to think outside of the box to arrive at novel solutions to a problem but it also focuses on lining up with convergent thinking. After all, you need your novel solution to work and to make sure it works, you may wanna test it with convergent thinking, the ability to provide correct or established answers to problems. So to see just how hard it is to be creative on the spot, there's one last video I have for you guys. It's called 90 Second Alphabet, very fun. And you can see that sometimes it's not too easy to make things up on the spot. 
Now, when it comes to measuring intelligence, I'm sure the test that most of you are familiar with is the intelligence quotient. The score on a test designed to measure intelligence, it is derived from the Binet Intelligence Scale, now known as the Stanford Binet Intelligence Scale. And the story goes that Alfred Binet was hired by the government to, well, basically see how well the children were learning or not learning. So the intelligence quotient, the intelligence quotient test was fo focused via standardization. It's a method of testing in which administration, scoring, and interpretation of results are consistent, as well as norming. So after we found a standardized way to administer the IQ test, it was done to see norming. The test was administered to large populations, so data can be collected to reference what would be known as the normal scores for a population and its group. This is important because by administering these intelligence tests to the children, we can see what, cat what is categorized as normal and what would be categorized as maybe developmentally behind or even ahead. And one interesting thing we see with the IQ test is the Flynn effect, the observation that each generation has a significantly higher IQ than the previous generation. Now, one thing to keep in mind, though, that doesn't mean higher levels of intelligence, rather the higher capabilities for intelligence. So this we see is a bell curve. The intelligence quotient score happens to land on a normal curve, as we see here, because of the representative sample was large enough. A representative sample is a subset of the population that accurately represents the general population. So thanks to the standardization of this test, we were able to have these norming effects. And one thing we see in this chart is 100, and then 100 to 115. From 100 to 115, that's one standard deviation. 115 to 130, that's the second standard deviation. And then above 130, 145 would be the third standard deviation. The standard deviation is simply the measurement of variability that describes the difference between a set of scores and a mean. So for most people, the average IQ is around 100. They land within one standard deviation of the IQ. But for those who fall with a score of 70 or below, that would indicate significant cognitive delays and major deficits in adaptive functioning. So the real reason that Binet was hired is to you know see how well these children are performing and he was able to create this test and show to the government uh, what is normal and what isn't and his test has evolved it is now the Stanford Binet intelligence scale of course there are other intelligence test tests used today but we see that it is very important to measure intelligence by measuring intelligence we can see what's normal and what isn't and it works for us to figure out more about the background of intelligence. Now, for the most part, this is a topic that we talked about back in biopsych. It is believed that intelligence comes from the range of reaction. That is, each person's response to the environment is based on a unique genetic makeup. So we have this ability, this capability of intelligence, as long as we unlock it in the right environment. Of course, sometimes while we try, we may run into learning disorders. One common one is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. And other times we see learning disabilities, cognitive disorders that affect different areas of cognition, particularly language or reading, considered specific neurological impairments rather than global intellectual or developmental disabilities. So one learning disability we are commonly aware of is dyslexia and it is when well you can go ahead and read it and tell me what you think it is it is when we are unable to properly see the letter the words or letters actually anything written down become very distorted and skewed it's a horrible learning disorder that does affect uh, many people as well as dyscalculia but there are many who can overcome dyslexia so this concludes what we have for the chapter on cognition. Make sure you participate in the discussions and good luck on the exam.